Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me today is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And also we have our foreign policy guy, Zachary Yost, who's joining us to talk a little bit about uh, international relations uh, and the current situation. We got the U.S. basically courting three wars at the moment. Um, the question is, <laughs> is, it, is it delusional to think the U.S. can fight three wars at once uh, or assert its wished for hegemony in three places at once and be successful at it? And we'll kind of look at some, uh, some issues going on right now that suggest that maybe that's not quite the case. But first, I want to make sure and mention our upcoming event in October. It's uh, just about one month away, and that is our Supporter Summit 2024. That's taking place beginning on October 10th through the 12th in Hilton Head, South Carolina. If uh, There's going to be all sorts of speakers. They're all of our top people, wide variety of talks, and this is for you as supporters to come and see your favorite speakers, get a chance to talk to them. There'll be plenty of food and events, things to do. Uh, so if you'd like to, to come and interact with uh, your favorite Mises people, be sure and go to Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G, and click on events. And of course, we'll be debuting our new documentary on the Fed, our world premiere. That's going to be very exciting. And also, uh, one of our keynote speakers, uh, Tom Luongo, who always has very interesting thoughts about the economy and foreign policy. Uh, he's going to be there. Very excited for that. But also for Radio Rothbard listeners, reminder, you can get a free book, How to Think About the Economy by Per Byland. A great introductory book. Great for yourself if you have uh, you know, a child going to high school or, or even college, if you have a neighbor, um, anyone who needs to think, uh, need, needs to have a basic understanding of uh, proper economics, you can get your free copy at Mises.org slash RothPodFree. That's Mises.org slash R-O-T-H-P-O-D-F-R-E-E free. All right. Well, let's talk about the state of uh, U.S.'s attempts to uh, rule the entire world, which is basically stated U.S. policy. Several months ago, uh, Zach, you and I were talking about some new reports coming out of the federal government, and they were basically saying that uh, the U.S. capacity for uh, asserting its power worldwide is essentially without limit. That official U.S. policy is there is no part of the world that is not subject to U.S. intervention and military dominance. And this is what the, what the military says is the plan. And the question is, is, okay, well, how realistic is that, especially given political constraints? And that's, that's what we're going to see as a, a big recurring theme here, is a lot of people misunderstand how military power works. They think it's, it has no connection to politics, that it's purely tactical, and it's just a matter of creating enough ammo, building enough ships so that you can destroy the other guy's military, or I guess the whatever non-state um, militant groups you're dealing with. But of course, that's never been the reality. I mean, you can see how this is misunderstood by people who, you still encounter people who think that the Vietnam War was a good example. And what they'll talk about is how the reason the United States didn't win the Vietnam War is the U.S. just didn't do it right. And the U.S. just didn't try hard enough. And uh, they, they chickened out. Well, the reality, of course, is that the U.S. regime lost political support for that war. And this is what often happens. This is usually why regimes lose wars, is they lose political support for a variety of reasons. They're not doing well in the war. The war is perceived to be costly by the people. And this doesn't have to be a democratic country. This could be any sort of country. And the costs are deemed to be no longer worth the benefits, uh, especially in human lives or in taxation. And people just become uninterested in whatever the cause is. So there's a difference between what the regime thinks needs to happen and what the people think needs to happen. And this is, this is very common. And so in order to win a war, you have to maintain support for that war through some means. And if you lose the support of the people who provide the funding and the support for that war, 
you're probably going to lose the war, regardless of what your capacity of building more weapons is. The people who seem to think that wars are just about winning tactical victories seem to think that there's really no limit on just building more guns and ships and uh, bringing in more soldiers. But there are significant political limits on that. There are limits. Uh, state regimes are constrained by the realities of the world and political realities. If those realities did not exist, certainly the United States has the means, enough trillions of dollars that it could squeeze out of its voters to just build the world's most humongous military that could rule the entire world with an iron fist, at least in the short run, until enough guerrilla troops organize themselves to finally start fracturing the world into different groups again. But that's not how the world works. It's not a matter of just creating more guns and ships. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and how we, the U.S. has a long way to go if uh, its, its plan is just to create a lot more munitions and hope that everything goes well and that somehow the public and the voters are going to go along with the whole thing. But I think we're going to anchor this whole thing on three specific areas, and I'm just going to hand it over to you, Zach, and just kind of into to introduce those, and then we can kind of pick them apart a little bit and go from there. So uh, if, if I'm the United States and I'm looking out at the world, I mean, obviously, I think the whole world is subject to me, all right? I'm at the Pentagon. Hey, look, here's a big map of the world. Everything is my domain. But there's certain parts of the world that seem to be particularly problematic right now and are eating up a lot of the U.S.'s resources. So w what's going on there? Right, yeah. So the, the, the three main areas in the news are obviously the war in Ukraine, although that's been less in the news since it's going worse and worse for the Ukrainians. The Middle East as a whole, which has sort of more three specific places, Israel and Gaza, the Houthis in Yemen, and then Iran, and then East Asia, which is mostly concerned about China and Taiwan. And we're not. <laughs> uh, trade-offs exist, and we see that in reality, even though official policy is trade-offs don't exist. So <laughs> that affects how we're doing things. Well, when I, when I what makes me think of this most it was in recent days, and I think we both saw the same thing and, and came to a similar conclusion, was we were looking at the situation in the Red Sea. And I saw, I was just looking at how these ships are being attacked by Houthis, and clearly there's not free navigation in the Red Sea right now. But all of our lives, we've been told that the, a main reason the U.S. Navy exists is to destroy piracy, to keep all the shipping lanes open, to keep global trade going, and you need a huge navy to do that. It's You've got one group of dirt poor, whatever you want to call them, militants, terrorists, insurgents, whatever, and th they're managing to really complicate the situation in the Red Sea, of course, which is connected to the Suez Canal. It's a major shipping lane. So what, what did all these trillions of dollars to the Navy over the decades go for if they can't even keep the the shipping lanes open in the Red Sea for a bunch of tiny little poorly funded uh, terrorist groups that it seems like maybe their priorities are wrong they're too busy fighting the Russians which has no bearing whatsoever on <laughs> on American life and while true, most U.S. trade does not go through the Suez Canal, you could see Americans would actually benefit from free global trade. But it seems the American Navy can't even handle that. So, gee, uh, what, what's the deal there? How come this is all going so poorly? Right. So a big part of it is that as technology has changed, so has the way of fighting. And the U.S., I mean, really everyone is sort of figuring it out as we go. And Iran is basically just providing weapons to the Houthis. And there's a, a Politico headline that uh, from, uh, oh, from last December, actually, that really sums up things. A $2 million missile versus a $2,000 drone. Pentagon worried over cost of Houthi attacks. So over the years... We have invested gajillions of dollars into missile defense technology, and there's been skeptics of missile defense 
especially when it comes to nuclear weapons uh, from the beginning. And there were people who were really excited about the Patriot missile batteries, which performed horribly in the first Gulf War. The government was caught lying about their, <laughs> how great they were. And they supposedly did so great when we invaded Iraq in 2003, but the government still won't release <laughs> uh, the data on how well they actually did. And then, so then people were believing the Ukrainians when they're like, oh my goodness, we're shooting down, you know, 105% <laughs> of uh, Russian missiles. And uh, the new head of the Ukrainian military just said in an interview, oh yeah, we're shooting about half of them down, which I would probably say is a generous estimate at that. But anyway, these missile defense missiles cost tons of money. And thanks to drones and uh, sort of innovations and in technology like that, you can now, you know, attack something with a device that costs, you know, $2,000 on the small end to, to like the Shahids that are really big in Ukraine are estimated to cost about $20,000. Uh, a pop. Well, you can't afford <laughs> to shoot <laughs> lots of multi-million dollar missile defense missiles at these uh, comparatively, you know, pennies uh, uh, offensive missiles. And it's very easy to just overwhelm missile defense systems where they fire all their missiles at these cheap drones and then, oh, look, here comes a, a hypersonic missile that nothing, you know, can, there's nothing left to try and shoot at it. So obviously that was a big problem in the Red Sea, where because Iran is the one who's developed lots of this technology, I suspect, because <laughs> they knew they couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the U.S. if that war were to happen, so they've spent decades developing it. And they've been importing it into Russia, shipping it over to the Houthis. And we had an aircraft carrier in the Red Sea that's left uh, because it was on duty for so long, but also it wasn't being very effective. We spent several billion dollars, I believe, bombing Yemen, which has already been bombed for like a decade by Saudi Arabia with our help, and it didn't really accomplish anything because you just basically set up this little ramp type launcher to launch these little drones. They don't, you know, it's not like you have to hide a mobile uh, ballistic missile launcher or something, although they, they do have larger missiles as well. Uh, so all of our bombing has accomplished nothing. They keep blowing up ships and we keep reallocating resources to the Middle East as a whole. Uh, but the, the Red Sea is still basically it's not closed, they're still shipping, but it's greatly reduced. And uh, to your point about, you know, the U.S. being not lots of our trade going through there, it really is an absurd case of free riding. You know, I mean, the, the, the group that, the state that probably has the most at stake is Egypt. I forget how much of their state budget comes from the Suez Canal, but it's a lot. They obviously are losing tons of money, yet they're not doing anything about it. And why would they? You know, the U.S. is there. We give them several billion dollars a year uh, to do nothing, really, uh, even though, as we talked about in a previous episode, at one point they were trying to sell 40,000 missiles to Russia. Uh, I mean, it's just absurd how we're being taken advantage of. We should but... also note, of course, that the Egyptian regime is heavily funded historically by the U.S. regime. Uh, and uh, the U.S., I think... Uh, for many years, it's been Egypt and the state of Israel that have vied for the top recipient of U.S. military aid. And that uh, the, basically it's a military dictatorship in Egypt and that, uh, that their economy is like a socialist economy where um, it's done through the military. So huge numbers of Egyptians work directly for the military or rely on military spending in some way for their livelihoods. And a ton of that money comes from the U.S. regime. So not only is their military largely funded by the U.S. in many cases, but they're not using any of that in their own territorial waters and they're not doing anything 
to keep the Suez Canal open, which of course is a huge source of prestige and revenue for them. So uh, yeah, they, again, the US, which already is supposedly has these partner states in the region, those partner states aren't doing anything. And the US has to, to head on over with its own ships and do the whole thing, which it's not terribly effective at doing. Maybe the Navy actually isn't there for uh, keeping pirates and such under control and keeping shipping lanes open. Maybe we were lied to about why the Navy exists. I don't know. Anything's possible. <laughs> yes, and the um, a topic in the news in relation to the Navy in the Middle East is we have a lot of naval assets in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the part of the Red Sea, not very close to Yemen now, though, and in the um, Persian Gulf. And this is, of course, all because of Israel and Hamas and Iran. And we actually have amphibious assault ships in the region, uh, which, if those were used, <laughs> boy, that'd be mean we're in a big mess. But what why this is important is it it shows what a lie it is that nothing is beyond our capacity because as a result of moving all these aircraft carriers to the region there is actually no aircraft carriers in east asia right now which i'm fine with personally because i don't think we need to defend taiwan i think they are capable of defending themselves as we've talked about actually that's my first time on radio rothbard uh, several years ago. Well, and the but, last time I checked, Japan uh, is not a poor country, so it could could field its own navy as well, if necessary. Yes, yes, and um, Taiwan's not poor either. Uh, but the all of the talk, I mean, going back to Obama, was oh, this pivot to Asia, where we're going to China's our focus, you know, and you know, this is why we got out of Afghanistan in such a messy way. We need to focus on China. Well, <laughs> you know, they're not doing what they suppose, the, the, you know, this is supposedly such a big goal, the rise of China, containing China, so important, such a danger. <laughs> but actually, in practice, we're back in the Middle East, uh, you know, because of our less than good partners there who are just sort of trying to drag us in, in f to fight their own wars and back up their own sort of pretty disastrous foreign policy. And uh, <laughs> as a, uh, a recent headline just shows how delusional, really, the military planners and all the bloviating politicians are, uh, this is in... Uh, U.S. Naval Institute news. Navy could sideline 17 support ships due to manpower issues. Uh, for over a decade now, there's been a huge push to increase the number of ships in the Navy, and there's been reports from various parts of the federal government and from various think tanks saying the U.S. Navy is way undermanned by something like 13 or 14 percent. Uh, Officers are never getting enough sleep. People are overworked. That's why we have these disasters like, you know, multi-billion dollar ships burning, <laughs> burning, you know, uh, in the harbor. Why we have, you know, our naval ships crashing into enormous uh, ocean cargo liners. And, you know, now we're at the point where we literally have to mothball ships because we don't have enough sailors to man them. So it's just sort of like this. It's... Uh, it almost seems like the people running the show are manic or something in terms of just being so detached from reality but sort of caught up in a frenzy of action. And, of course, the real danger is that this could result in some sort of catastrophic disaster that, you know, on the worst end could lead to, like, a shooting war with a nuclear power uh, or, you know, on the lower end, just accidents that lead to people dying and bajillions of dollars of equipment, you know, burning up in an accident. So it's cr it's really insane that and it's not sustainable. It's sort of the, there's going to be a problem, a big problem at some point and it doesn't seem anyone's too concerned about it, which is nuts. Yeah, it uh, this seems to be a recent phenomenon uh, where <laughs> 
they just, no matter how much they talk about pivoting away from Asia, I mean, recent as in the last 10 years, right? No matter how much they keep talking about it. So long as the state of Israel is located in the Middle East, I don't think the U.S. can be <laughs> pivoting away from the Middle East. It just, uh, given the structure of U.S. interest groups and who runs Congress, I just don't see, oh, yep, you're on your own now, State of Israel. I mean, every time there's some even minor conflagration there, they start sending carriers to the Eastern Mediterranean, at least, and maybe also to the Persian Gulf, so you can start throwing your weight around next to Iran, that sort of thing. And it just keeps going. And yeah, so they've recalled, because they've been on, I think I saw here that um, a lot of these carriers in the Pacific are have been in the ocean for 11 months and are coming up on a year, right? These are just, they're, they're out of resource in terms of manpower and they badly in need of maintenance. They're just sitting in the harbor in, in San Diego and other such places. And so, so what do you do that? I guess you could just build more carriers, right? That's what they're gonna go and, <laughs> and say they need. The, the Navy's always complaining that it needs more resources, which Arguably, it does if you are intent on maintaining the same amount or more of U.S. meddling worldwide. If you're going to ask the Navy to rule over the and all the nations of the all the oceans of the earth, sure, you need a bigger navy. Uh, and they've been saying for years, right? Uh, the U.S. Navy is an 11 carrier navy in a 15 carrier world. Uh, well, I'm sure they'd love to have more than 15. And, but these are super expensive endeavors. Uh, I think the stat I saw here is that just for the boat is $16 billion. But that doesn't include anything else. It doesn't include all the planes you put on the boat and all of the, the, uh, the technological systems involved, not to mention all of the personnel. And so you're probably looking more at like, I don't know, 50 billion or something or more. And, and that's just like your initial cost, right? Yeah, I mean, you're maintaining a nuclear reactor right. for decades. That adds up. And so <laughs> multiply that by 15 or more. You're talking about a lot of money just for that. And that's not the Navy overall, of course. And then, of course, on top of that, carriers are really for projecting offensive power uh, if, if your real interest was just defense, car uh, carriers would not be essential at all in that endeavor. Uh, but that's what we're talking about. The carriers are there so you can, you, can, uh, you can sail them to whatever country you don't like at any given time and threaten them. And carriers are very good for that. And it's also questionable, though, as, you know, are carriers becoming like the battleship in terms of... Uh, is their era slowly coming to an end? I mean, carriers are not going to be super helpful uh, if the U.S. were to go to war with China over Taiwan. Basically, all of the war games uh, in the sort of most, you know, they usually they're divided up between like everything goes great to like everything's a disaster. And then there's like in the middle, even in the middle cases, we lose one or two carriers. I mean, you know, China is... <laughs> 90 miles away from Taiwan and, you know, even sort of very hawkish think tanks come out with war games where they're like, yeah, all of the U.S. planes in Japan will be destroyed within 24 hours, most on the ground in just this enormous missile barrage. And also there's, as we see in Ukraine, there's been a lot of, uh, we, we are seeing how, you know, air defenses are working out basically. I mean, the US has had basically uncontested air power <laughs> for decades. And uh, uh, obviously people who worry they might be fighting the US have taken that into account when they figure how they would fight us. I mean, some people argue Russia has the most advanced air defense systems. Uh, at any rate, they're not, <laughs> they're not, uh, uh, Neither side in Ukraine versus Russia is really flying tons of sorties within the other's air defense range, which is why uh, the Russian Air Force was not super active versus now because they are adapting their ginormous stock of Soviet 
dumb bombs <laughs> that they couldn't really use, and they're attaching these basically glide systems. They're called fabs. I don't remember what that stands for. But now they're, <laughs> they're being used to deadly effect because they have tons of them. It costs 20 grand to fix this sort of uh, satellite-guided glide system, and then you can drop a, you know, a multi-thousand-pound bomb on a bunker somewhere. Uh, much cheaper than a missile. But, but anyway, uh, so it's questionable how much an aircraft carrier will be able to project power going forward uh, against an adversary who has air defenses. And so it's, it wouldn't surprise me if Congress is like, yeah, we need more aircraft carriers, and then, you know, they're what? useless. Yeah. And I, I think that's a big aspect of what is, you know, you know, when we talk about military spending, when we talk about military capability, and so much of it is backwards facing, it's backwards looking, it's politicians and these bureaucracies and, you know, just the, the incompetency of what you expect government to do is that the, the, the full war, I mean, again, we, we're, we're dealing with a massive revolution in the way that war is actually being fought and played out right now in the biggest theater right now with the, the Russia-Ukraine situation is that you know, on top of how much we are spending, the actual capabilities within modern warfare, uh, their actual effectiveness on the field is, is, is being greatly diminished while we're spending more and more on these antique systems, yeah, effectively antique systems. And, and that's an aspect of it, which again, is completely, it seems to be, be almost entirely lost in terms of these larger policy discussions going on. Because this, this is kind of a, a gigantic deal when, all the, when, when our most expensive weapon systems are quickly becoming obsolete. And that's another point of, like, I, it's questionable if we could even build more aircraft carriers. Uh, going back to that report on, basically, <laughs> the, the Pentagon's idea of how to implement, you know, war socialism, they're like, we need over 100,000 more people, uh, uh, you know, industrial workers, to build the next generation of uh, nuclear-powered subs. Well, <laughs> that's already in the docket to be built. You know, how many more would we need to, you know, start building a, a brand new tranche of aircraft carriers? So it's like just another example of no, <laughs> trade-offs exist and everything is not within our capacity. Oh, and also just like it would be no big deal to get the skilled labor necessary to produce the, that sort of manufactured item. Uh, it's not like, oh, oh we need 100,000 workers, no problem. How do you get those 100,000 workers? Well, you have to pay them more than the going market rate. You have to entice people. And that's traditionally how the government gets skilled people, is the private sector produces a lot of skilled people, and then the government poaches them with higher wages. And we can see that all the time, and how the government pays, how federally, federally paid workers are paid more than private sector workers. Uh, this is just standard, and the feds like to entice people away with more pay. And so it's not like, hey, well, there's no limits. We'll just, we'll just spend more money. Oh, never mind the fact that the U.S. is now running $2 trillion deficits every single year. And that monetary policy is essentially in a sort of panic mode trying to figure out how can we uh, push interest rates on this huge debt back down slightly without triggering large amounts of new price inflation. Like everything now is becoming problematic in terms of debt service, in terms of dealing with the uh, the annual deficits, with the, which are huge. But you've still got people living in fantasy land, acting like, well, we'll just spend another 500 billion on producing these new weapons, as if that's that's not a major problem, far beyond just simply raising enough money to build a few more boats. This is these people are acting like. Fiscal policy is just no big deal. They're living in the year like 19, I don't know, 71, basically. Acting like it's just, well, we'll just print more money. We'll just build some more stuff. And that's just not the reality of the world. I guess that's part of the problem you get where people who work in geopolitics don't really have the slightest clue how fiscal policy works or how money works, how interest rates work, that sort of thing. It's just a matter of sending your lobbyists to Congress and arguing for more money. And I think that worked 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but those days are over, especially when you're going to have to raise that money uh, on by cutting more money out of things like Social Security and Medicare and that sort of stuff. It's rapidly getting to the point where you're going to have to make a choice between more military spending 
and more social services. And which ones are the voters going to care the most about? There's, it's pretty clear that they're going to care more about getting their free stuff from the government. I mean, people still mostly believe that myth that they, quote unquote, paid in to Social Security. Uh, and that that's somehow their money. It's not just money stolen from a current worker and handed over to a <laughs> retiree. Uh, but they, that's, that guides their ideology. So what are you going to – I'm sure these, these retirees would be fine with sending more young American men to get blown up in the service of the state of Israel or something like that. But they would definitely have a problem with taking their money and handing it over to the creation of more munitions to fight one of these wars if it meant a single dime going down in their Social Security checks. So there are real <laughs> political problems here that there is no solution being offered except print more money. And acting like, oh, we'll deal with the problem with that at some point in the future. Uh, but these are real problems that we discussed on other podcasts, other episodes of this podcast, just about the realities of having to pay. And we're facing it right now. You're just looking at a trillion dollars or more per year now is going to paying interest on the debt. And that's about equal to what the defense budget is now. So what happens when it's 1.5 trillion or maybe 2 trillion? Where are you going to get that money? If you just print more money, that just increases the interest you have to pay on the debt. Also rises up, raises <laughs> price inflation, which that's the reason you can't buy a house, kids, is all that money printing. And it's the reason your groceries cost insane amounts. It's all that money printing. So just acting like there's no cost to that. Just, just build another 10 carriers. Just... Uh, pay another 100,000 workers to build this stuff. Just raise the wages of uh, the the soldiers we're trying to recruit. That's why, of course, as we talked about earlier, they, they end up talking about a draft because that's cheap. But the, <laughs> it's just absolute fantasy land that a lot of these people are living in, acting like there's no real constraints upon these things. Now... Of course, as you said, as you started out saying, I'm fine with there being no carriers in East Asia, right? And of course, I had to laugh at some of the lines in these articles I was reading about the fact that they're withdrawing the carriers from East Asia. One of the articles said, all the carriers have been withdrawn in East Asia, and, and now China just, just freely sails around the Western Pacific. <laughs> I'm like, like, oh no, it's as if China is in East Asia. <laughs> and you could just imagine somebody saying something like, oh, man, the Chinese and the Russians had to withdraw all of their subs from the Gulf of Mexico. So now the Americans are just doing whatever they want in the Gulf of Mexico, as if that seemed like a weird thing. Uh, but you, it's, uh, Americans still can't get out of this, this idea that the United States should be uh, in charge of the water surrounding East Asia. And I guess that just stems from World War II and the whole... South Korea, Japan thing, I think is all an important part of that. But folks, 1945 was a long time ago, and uh, maybe it's time <laughs> to start coming to grips with the, the new modern realities. Yeah, the um, to the point on the draft, I would just, uh, I, th I think I might have said this last time, but just, you know, if you're worried about being drafted, go get a welding certificate. You know, then you'll be too skilled. Your your services will be too high in demand uh, for uh, for that. And I think last time we also mentioned the meme about uh, like, oh, Taylor Swift endorses Harris, and you know now me and the boys are in Taiwan, and it's some video game thing. Well, <laughs> Taylor Swift just endorsed Harris, and now all those memes are all over the place now. So I just find that hilarious. And I think we should talk real quick about Ukraine. Uh, and then the context of, well, I mean, Ukraine, it's a disaster. And it, it, it looks like it's going, you know, it's not exactly moving at a blitzkrieg pace, but all the trends, it's, it's very clear Russia is gaining ground basically all along the front. And uh, the Ukrainians actually attacked, you know, pre-war Russia, Kursk Oblast, uh, about a month ago. And, of course, all the NAFO bros and, you know, all of the people who just are so emotionally invested in Ukraine were going, you know, like crying in tears of joy about, like, oh, this is so amazing and great. And uh, 
it was just sort of absurd. My and, favorite uh, thing to do is if you look at the Kursk region and the uh, the map of the Ukrainian incursion into uh, Russia, <laughs> just to zoom out, <laughs> zoom back to see how much <laughs> of that incursion, what percentage of that is of Russia. Uh, or even of Russia's best real estate. Actually, the, arguably, the real estate down south by Crimea and and throughout eastern Donetsk and all of that, that's all better real estate than Kursk anyway. I wonder if, I bet the Russians might be willing to uh, do a trade. Here, we'll take, we'll take the Sea of Azov <laughs> coastline. We'll take Crimea. You can have Kursk because it's just so unessential to, to anything in Russia. Uh, but yeah, back to you on how this was supposed to be some great achievement for Ukraine. Well, yeah, that's what some people argue, actually. And sort of uh, Zelensky sort of seemed to say that it's like, oh, this is a bargaining chip, which I don't uh, find realistic at all. But uh, yeah, I mean, Kursk is apparent. I mean, it's enormous. And I didn't realize this. There's only like a million people in it. And it's like the size of some European countries. So it's sort of just wilderness. Um, but in order to do this attack, the Ukrainians pulled a bunch of experienced units from the front down in the Donbass to, to do this. And the uh, a whole bunch of pro-Ukrainian people then started to freak out a few weeks later because Russia was rapidly advancing on this city called, I think it's called Poltava, uh, which is a really important rail juncture. Uh, Ukraine has... People seem to forget Ukraine is like a very poor place. Like they don't really have much in the way of what we Americans would consider highways and whatnot. Uh, so rail is important, is like essential for logistics and whatnot. And beyond Poltava, there's like no defenses for something like 60 or 100 miles. It's basically nothing. So a whole bunch of pro-Ukrainian people started to freak out because they're like, oh, gee, we thought Poltava might fall in a few months, but it could fall in a few weeks. <laughs> and uh, so after it became apparent Kursk was not going anywhere, the Ukrainians put one of their most experienced units in Poltava. But it's not, it's, I don't really think it's going to change anything. Actually, I have a piece in the national interest uh, last week. They are having a forum on Kursk. And some of the takes are, in my opinion, quite delusional that it's uh, people like it's the most important aspect of the war. Whereas my my stance was this is not uh, going well and it's not a sign of Ukrainian strength. It's a sign of Ukrainian desperation because it doesn't matter if they had kept all those experienced units around Poltava and on the line because it would just delay the Russian advance. So it's either well, we can gamble and maybe try and, you know, oh, maybe we could seize a power plant, a nuclear power plant in Kursk or something or do something. And if it doesn't work, well, we'll lose a little sooner rather than we're just going to lose for sure if we wait around. So I, I view it as a sign of weakness. And I mean, Zelensky now is like, oh, we need to have peace negotiations and Russia has to come to them. You might recall there this absurd peace peace summit that Russia wasn't invited to. It was just ridiculous. But obviously now they're they're coming to accept that the plan of we're demanding all the pre-war borders and Crimea back is not going to go anywhere. So anyway, the whole point is this has been a complete fiasco. We've spent over a hundred billion dollars and depleted tons of our stockpiles, and you know had to reroute things from other theaters, and it's going to be a disaster. And we can look at the Red Sea. We spent a few billion there, dropped all these bombs. Disaster. The Suez Canal is effectively half-closed. And it's like, has anyone been punished uh, professionally for all of these failures? And I mean, no. But that's not surprising, because no one was punished for Afghanistan, and no one was punished for Iraq. Uh, so what you know, it's sort of if there's no cost to failure, or if anything, you just fail upward. No one was punished uh, for 9 11. I mean, it's, it's yeah, yeah. the same <laughs> yes. thing over and over. Yes. And, and it's so, it's just sort of like going back to my earlier point that we just seem to be headed for disaster because uh, no one is held accountable for things going wrong and things are going to 
are set are being set up to go really, really, really wrong as we just continue to sort of manically, schizophrenically dash from East Asia to Ukraine to Yemen, uh, not with enough resources, just sort of, it, it's really crazy and it's depressing and hopefully there'll be a change, but U.S. foreign policy changes slowly, if at all, so it's... All right, well, that's going to be it for this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you, Zachary Yost. Thank you, Tho Bishop, for joining me today. We'll be back next week with more, so we'll see you then.